Hello there, creators and makers. Thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate you spending your time with me and watching my videos. On today's installment, I've got some tooling upgrades that I'm hoping will help me on my make of the Kozo Hiroka Pennsylvania A3 Switcher steam locomotive to run on a three and a half inch gauge track. I took it upon myself to not only make the parts for the tender, but also some parts for some riding cars. So what that means is making eight journal boxes for the tender, but an additional 16 as well. I found this to be the most tedious yet. And unfortunately, I got myself into a little trouble, but I'll be getting more to the end of that in my next video. To help me along on my MIG, I decided I wanted to upgrade my tooling a little bit. So let's check out this new tooling and I'll give you kind of my perspective and see if it really is going to be an improvement for my mill. Now be sure to stay to the end as I'll be having another journeyman tip or trick of the day. So come on over here and join me at the bench and let's make some chips. The first item that I have here is a package from Sherlock and it is a four jaw check holdout set part number 3058. And I got this mostly to give myself more options to mount my vise because I don't think they sold a vise hold down set. Today's star from Sherline is going to be this half inch by two inch long end mill holder, part number 6086. It comes with a Tommy bar. Also, it doesn't come with a hex wrench. And normally Sherline throws a hex wrench in there with everything you buy. And much bigger and beefier than the 3 8s. A little bit of staining and grease on the end and it seems like it's going to come off. And it's going to let me do things like use my half inch diameter Starrett 827B edge finder, which has the traditional end as well as a hole centering feature on this end. So that's going to give me many more tools and capabilities to use. Headstock is, I think, 0.405 inches. So anything I put in there is going to bottom out on a spindle bore. Today I've got a great little package from McMaster Car, and this is the star for today. And let's see what we got in here. Made in USA, good American company, high speed steel, and a titanium coat, nitride coated, square end mill for flute. And that's just going to be wonderful because it's been so tedious doing these journal boxes. Being able to take fewer passes and to be able to machine the ends, it's just going to be great. And I'm looking forward to using this very much. And of course, I'm going to be using this half inch diameter end mill holder. So I got the longer one so that it correlates with a shorter shank on these half inch ones. You can see it will bottom out and it's just the right length for these. So that's going to be a nice use. To be more precise, it is a one and quarter inch length end mill shank, which is a perfect length for this Sherline end mill holder. And just as another item, I also went ahead and got myself a three eighths inch dual end end mill titanium nitrate coated, also man use. See, it's quite a bit bigger and heftier than the factory high speed seal. And it's going to allow me to machine the ends as well. As you can see, the half inch end mill holder is quite a bit bigger than the 3 8 And I like that because I think it's going to provide more support for the end mill. And I'm going to give it a little, snug it up just a tiny bit with my Tommy bars and get it set up. And I'm really excited and looking forward to using this titanium nitride American four flute cutter. But the standard small Sherline hex key that comes with everything doesn't fit it. It actually requires a 1 8. I think that's fair though, because the premise is if someone's going to be running a half inch cutter, they probably should own a full set of hex keys anyway. So I'm going to use it just a block of metal just to kind of get it up there and pay attention to this part. As you can see, the flutes start to turn just a little bit as the set screw bottoms out, which is something I never noticed on the smaller cutters. I'm going to give it a little bit snug and I'm going to load my part up in here. I've already roughed off a lot of the junk the mill slag with the fly cutter. And you're perfectly honest, it's a horrible finish because the fly cutters went bad and dull pretty quickly. And I just kept pushing them just to knock off that mill slag. So nothing is square. Set it down with a few light taps and wraps, making sure nothing's shifted. I'll be using a previous journeyman trick of the day to as uh, a piece of paper to set my cutter height. So, and I'll be sure to link that video with the journeyman trick of the day somewhere at the end of the video. But with the just catching, I'm, that means my cutter is within three thou or so of the surface of the part I'm going to mill. And then I'm going to go ahead and drop it another 10,000, 
which means this initial cut is going to be less than 10,000, but probably more than six. Safety first, always got to wear my safety glasses, plenty of cutting fluid, and let's make some chips. I have to say, this is a fantastic and unbelievable cutter and experience. You would think it's too big, but if you look at the headstock orientation in the background, it is solid. This cutter blows through this metal very easily, and it just feels different. It really does engage the part very differently than the two flute high speed steel cutters that come from the factory at Sherline. I'm really in love with this cutter. I'm really glad I have it. And I can't tell you how much of a relief it is to be able to make a couple passes versus four or five. The surface is really nice, pretty smooth. My flywheel marks are a little bit deep, and I can still see it just a very little tray. So that means that damage was probably another six. It was about six or seven, six to eight thousandths in depth. So I'm gonna drop it down another ten thou and make a true ten thou cut here. And we'll see what happens. And same thing, really going well with this machine. I'm not feeling vibration or bounce at all in my cutter. And it's a really nice experience. You wouldn't even think that I'm machining cold rolled steel, or not cold rolled, but hot rolled steel at this point. I did mess up a little bit, I covered it, it was a little bit over, and I left a bit of a lip here. But it's small enough, I feel pretty confident to take it off with the file. This finish is absolutely beautiful, absolutely smooth. If I didn't know any better, I would have thought that I was running my finger over glass. Today's journeyman tip of the day is something that I've really wanted to try since I've gotten my mill set up. Now, there isn't anything wrong with the tooling that comes in the Sherline Package A. But I think it's actually rather quite good. But that two flute cutter isn't quite long enough to machine the ends of Kozo's journal boxes. Consequently, with that two flute high speed steel cutter, all I can really do is machine each side individually and bring it into my dimensions. So that's six sides on a cube. With today's journeyman tip of the day, I'll be machining two sides together in a single setup. First, machining the front as you've seen, and then dropping down my cutter and machining the ends. That will ensure that if my headstock's trammed in correctly, that these two sides will be absolutely perpendicular to one another. Not having a well-trammed headstock with a bad tilt could end up leaving me with either an obtuse angle here or one that is very acute to the upper surface. I will then take my piece and rotate these two machine surfaces, one down against the parallel and the second against the hard jaw. Exposing my third and fourth surface. I'll next machine those and they'll be perpendicular to one another. And assuming that my machine has a properly trammed head with no nod and no tilt, all, first sur all four surfaces will be perpendicular to one another, leaving my fifth and sixth. And so I simply am able to rotate my, my piece around and bring those into dimension, and they should be perpendicular to every other surface. Let's see what the journeyman trick of the day actually looks like. Now I've already taken a moment to go ahead and set my distances using the journeyman paper trick. For this first cut, I'm really only going to be removing probably a touch under 5 thou, probably around 3 or 4 thou. And I'm going to begin by taking a conventional cut. It was running really nice, really smooth, horrible noise. So I've got something wrong with my speeds and feeds. It's looking really good. And if you pay attention to the headstock, there's no bounce. For my return cut, I'm going to be taking a climbing cut because I'm only really doing a finishing cut or pressure cut. I've gone in and taken another 5,000 off. Played a little, little bit with the speed, speeding it up to see if I can get a better control over that really horrible wailing noise. I've really cranked up the speed here and I'm going to just take a 5,000 cut. And you can see those chips are just flying off. Very uniform size chip. They're fiendishly sharp and horrible to deal, touch and deal with, which is why I gotta make sure I wear my safety glasses. But as, if you look at the headstock orientation to the background, it is not moving at all. It's pretty, it's absolutely solid and steady. And really the only movement happens from my clumsiness when I bump the table or a camera. Unfortunately, upping the speed has not cured that wailing. In fact, 
I know that's a problem because I shared the raw footage with the journeyman machinist. And the journeyman machinist's first comment was, well, what are your speeds and feeds? And did you look them up in machinery's handbook? Well, unfortunately, yeah, I answered no to both of those. It's more of a nut behind the hand wheel problem. But regardless of my amateur attempts, I am really impressed by the quality of finish being left behind by this cutter. And I'm really looking forward to see what I could do with it. What I should have done is slowed it down. And slowed it down quite a bit. And the number that we came up with that would have been the ideal cutting speed or RPM with this size cutter would have been about 560. Of course, running carbide, it could go up or running play height speed steel, it would go down. But as a general rule of thumb, 560 would have been the best. I'm really looking forward to seeing how this is going to turn out. I just really hope that my nod and my lean or tilt just absolutely perfect on my headstock and I've gotten it so far it feels absolutely glass smooth doesn't look glass smooth but it does feel it but that edge there that corner we had is sharp not razor blade sharp but pretty darn close so I'm going to go ahead and deburr this and see how it turns out as far as I can tell when compared to my angle here it, it is as accurate as this angle the only places that I've got light peeking through or where I scratched the surface with the file from deburring the edges but it is as accurate as this angle so I'm really happy about that I'm really happy I managed to tram in my machine well so that this could work out unfortunately showing those gaps of light just isn't something that photographs well or records well this cutter is going to be fantastic and I'm really looking forward to continuing using it and I think it is going to be a game-changing tool that's going to help me on my make of the Kozahiro Oka Pennsylvania A3 switcher steam locomotive engine in three-quarter inch scale to run on a three and a half inch gauge track. I am really looking forward to finishing up these journal boxes and this cutter is going to be paramount in doing so. So that you don't miss that installment be sure to hit that subscribe button as well as a bell notification so you never miss any of my videos. Till next time have fun out there Stay safe and keep making chips.